back from break. Uh, DK Panda, Ohio State University. Thank you very much for being here again. OK. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, thanks, uh, Brian, and uh, thanks, Mark, for inviting me here, I believe. This is the fourth time or third time I've come here, so th third one, yeah, um, from the second, um, third event onwards. So typically, you know, um, I have presented here with a lot of things, what we've been doing, like our MPI stack, big data, uh, deep learning kind of things. Those are the earlier uh, years of presentations I've done. Uh, today, it will be a little bit different. Uh, we have a very big new project uh, called Icicle. I gave a very short preview last year um, because the project was just starting, but today I'll go into more details. Uh, of course, tomorrow I have another like a sponsored talk where we'll be going into real MPI, DPU, those kind of things. So just to give a perspective, um, so this is a NSF, a National Science Foundation AI Institute called ICICLE. And if you're familiar, like for the last three years, National Science Foundation in US has been investing a lot on AI. So they have actually funded 25 of such institutes. Each one is $20 million, so they have done half billion dollar investment, okay, to take the field of the AI to the next phase. And we got funded in 2021, is like the second batch. And the focus is more on the cyber infrastructure, intelligent cyber infrastructure. There are all different components of AI. So this institute is dedicated, how do you really design the next generation cyber infrastructure for AI workload? So that's what I'll be talking today. So there is a lot of, uh, this is a very large group I lead. Uh, I'll go into more details. Um, this is our uh, website, you can take a look. Um, also the QR code, there's a lot of information. Uh, I'll just try to provide high level overview of the activities taking place in the next uh, 40 minutes. So first of all, since it's a very large team, I just want to provide credits to all the ICICLE team members. So this is not only my work, it is a very large, like almost 100, 150 people are working here. So uh, credits go to all of them. So I'll try to start with a high level ICICLE vision and goals, research challenges are being addressed. I'll highlight some of the selected accomplishments and then indicate how to get engaged and then some of the conclusions. And in fact, this follows very nicely what Andrew presented just before the break. Okay, so you will see a lot of similarity, but I'll go into a lot of, a lot of details here. So if you take a look at, like many of you are in the field of HPC here, if you take a very broad look, starting from maybe 1975, we we're only focusing on like scientific computing, or gradually the name changed to HPC. Around 2000, the big data field came. So then people started working on a lot of new projects, uh, research took place saying, okay, how do we combine HPC and big data? So then in another 10 years, the AI started coming and HPC plus AI started becoming very important. We are still in that bandwagon and then moving ahead. But there is this fourth thing which is happening. And this is what actually this institute is about and I'll be talking. In all those previous three phases, you will see data is mostly centralized. Okay? Or before you do the processing, you bring it to a big file system, then, then you just work from there. But now the thing has changed, so that is kind of the left side where we have all these HPC systems, data centers, cloud, you can talk. But in the right hand side, the data is coming from all different places now. Okay, data could be coming from a drone, data could be coming from some sensors. Okay, they are not like a static. Dynamically, they are coming from all different places. And then in that context, you need to actually process this data, whether you're traditional HPC or big data or AI, or any combinations of these, and make sense, and where to put the data, where to do the computation, where to store. So all these kind of newer challenges are coming. And that's what I'll be focusing on this right hand side, which is the computing continuum. So, so building systems are okay, but what are you going to, going to solve? So here I'll try to motivate there are three societal challenges, and that's what is actually a part of our proposal, just to demonstrate these things to really solve societal challenges. So the first one is agriculture, okay? You know, like if you take a look at some of this data here, in 2025, we'll have 9.8 billion people in the world, okay? And then, of course, if you take a look at the land and how the agriculture is taking place, compared to 1985, the the size of the arable land will actually go down by 50% because the urban growths are taking place, people are taking, you know, cutting down the, all the forest, uh, the farmlands, making buildings, and all. 
And so that is a, there is a very wide gain in the crop management. Okay? Because we have to harvest food to, to feed all of us, 9.8 billion people, and it has to be economical. So we need also sustainable agricultural workforce. So the next 20, 30 years, you will see the agriculture is no longer like belongs to traditional farmers. How AI can help? The workforce people, you will see, gradually more and more technology will go there. And then, and then if we can do that, this is where you will see democratization will happen. Like not only HPC, big data, AI, and everything will go into all these unmanned aerial vehicles, self-driving tractors, all these things will be used to, to harvest. So let me show you a very simple one, motivation, and I'll show you, like we have actually solutions towards that. So traditionally, if you see as a farmer, there's a very big land, and let's say there is some diseases have happened. I mean, we see that on our garden also, okay? Based on the, the weather, based on the rain, moisture, and all, we see some diseases. Now, if you see in a big field, of course, the farmers know those things. I mean, they have been cultivating for many, many years. So they know, yeah, this field has like a type one or type two kind of diseases. They, they go and spray pesticides. But is that accurate? Okay, just like you would have seen in your garden, you see 10 different varieties of diseases are happening. Okay, the, now the question is, if I just spray only one kind of pesticide, it may not be environmental friendly. It might be also more expensive. Can I bring AI technology here? Like, can I fly a drone? And in real time, can I take actual images and then do some kind of heat map? I'll try to show you. And using AI models of the different kinds of diseases, in real time, it can give you some data saying, look, this part of the field has disease X, this part of the field has disease Y or disease G, and then it can actually recommend. The farmer saying, okay, now you spray pesticide one here, two here, three here, or even a combination of those. In fact, it can even go further and in fact, bypass the farmer, and if you have intelligent tractors, it can actually send those commands to the tractors, okay? So the tractor is actually going and then spraying the appropriate kind of pesticides of any combination. You know, it's just like our showed up fountain. <laughs> you order <laughs> Pepsi or Coke, the bartender is giving you the appropriate one. So it's like this, you can mix. And this we want to do in real time, okay? So if you can achieve these kind of things, you will see you will be able to provide like the next field of digital agriculture. Of course, there are a lot of challenges. I talked about this computing continuum here. These are some of the challenges, like uh, how do you develop CI for autonomous self-driving farms? Um, how do you do like a uh, wrangling of the rapid generation data? How do you develop novel models, architecture, data sets, open and public agriculture services, adaptive AI as the edge, um, and then how do you do privacy? So a lot of these AI techniques actually have to be put together to, to, to make this complete solution. And then, the, of course, the thing is, like, how do we provide this kind of a services to the farmers? If I ask the farmer saying, you have to learn PyTorch, TensorFlow, forget it, all right? I mean, they don't know anything about that. Even then, then I say, okay, I can provide you something, a solution which costs $100,000. Answer is no. Can we convert all these things to like an app? I mean, I'm sure all of you are familiar with app. I mean, think of like a WhatsApp. If some of you, I'm sure you would have used. It's a very simple interface. You just say, okay, I'm sending this message. You get a tick saying, yeah, it got delivered. If the receiver had read, you get two ticks, that's all. You don't know, need to know anything what is happening. The behind the scene, the cyber infrastructure is taking care of that. So we want to do like this. So it's like an AI as a service. We can provide a, like a digital agriculture as an AI as a service, let's say $9.99 per month. So then you'll see the farmers will come and we'll start using. So that is our, actually our broad vision. Um, what we are trying to achieve. Let's take animal, another uh, societal challenge is animal ecology. You know, we as human beings coexist with animals. The, the way the animals move around, their behavior has a lot of implications on climate change, on how we actually, um, the biodiversity. So here the same thing happens. Like uh, how do we monitor, understand the protect biodiversity of the planet? How do we monitor and understand the impact and then take that into the translational aspects. The third one is a food distribution, okay? Agriculture is one thing we're producing, but there's a big challenge to have food distribution, okay? And, and especially here, like a food supply chain vulnerability, all of a sudden some emergency happened. I mean, we are seeing in the world every day something happens somewhere. 
like let's say there is a California, there is a big wildfire started, or now we are seeing in Canada. Okay, so that area has got suddenly disrupted. So how do you, in a very rapid response, indicate to all the logistics company, or the producers, or the consumers, say okay, you need to move around your your logistic organizations. Okay, so so that means the so we want to make very quick supply chain decisions um, to make sure that this food gets delivered, and especially this happened in the COVID time. Many of you, at least in the US, you would have seen in the news, a lot of Florida farmers were dumping uh, their crops because nobody was able to move them away. On the other hand, there were like big lines in food banks in other parts of the country. They were standing in line for food. So they couldn't actually breeze it, okay? So how do we want to really breeze this? With the very simple tools, if a shop manager or a logistic company or a driver, they have access to all these things. So that's why we are trying to do like a democratizing AI. So that means taking the AI to real common people. If we can provide that, then you will see there will be really get benefits of the AI. So these are the kind of the three use science cases we have chosen in our project because of the diverse nature and the societal impact kind of things. And of course, there's a big gap. I mean, we heard about like, let's say, Tesla, uh, all intelligent cars. I mean, it's, of course, if you have a big amount of money, you can actually <laughs> use the AI. But how do we really take it to the, the farming, to the supply chain and all? So there is an ever-growing gap. And existing AI applications are developed for those areas. I mean, things are being developed, but there is no standardization. There is no, nothing is being done in a very concrete manner. So we want to make sure that we develop these kind of solutions. And the CI's complexity, if we don't handle this properly, it will actually impede the adoption of AI into these domains. So that is the kind of the very broad goal here. And similar more examples happen, like a smart cities, smart manufacturing, smart transportation, real-time surveillance, even a lot of things in the medicine. We, we heard like from the morning keynote talk, like a pathology and all those things. People are trying to use AI, like instead of a doctor spending 15 minutes of the time trying to diagnose whether this is a kind of a cancer, can actually the AI tools help you? Um, we are not saying that the machine will actually give you the final diagnosis, but it will help you. The doctor might be the doctor needs to spend only two minutes now. So this is the broad challenge of this institute. So how do we design the next generation intelligent cyber infrastructure for this computing continuum with heterogeneous resources? As I indicated, to have sensors, drones, to GPUs, CPUs, DPUs, you name anything in the computing continuum, we need to make sure that our end-to-end -end designs are actually working there. And that too also, we want to do it in a plug-and-play manner. So that is one of the key, that how do you design that tomorrow there is a new GPU has come, it should be able to work there and deliver the performance. As expected, you don't have to totally redesign uh, the, the, the stack. And, and uh, we want to make sure that the stakeholders are being benefited and then societal challenges are being happening. So there's a very nice short video here. Let's, uh, let's play that and then listen to it. A policymaker wants to know how land use policies will affect their region's biodiversity. A farmer is concerned about how new weather patterns will affect crop yield while food distributors and public health officials are concerned with how supply chain disruptions will affect deliveries of nutritious foods to communities. Current technology can provide data and models to tackle grand challenges such as biodiversity, conservation, and agricultural and food system resilience. But it still lacks the infrastructure to link across data and models seamlessly to answer complex questions from diverse stakeholders' perspectives. Even AI experts are challenged to create standardized solutions across domains because a standardized cyber infrastructure integration with AI just doesn't exist. Enter ICICLE, intelligent cyber infrastructure with computational learning in the environment. ICICLE is an institute dedicated to building a national AI-driven computational infrastructure that functions as a utility, much like our electricity, water, and transportation infrastructure. This new utility will enable the delivery of AI to end users with the flick of a switch, enlightening solutions for imminent problems of national, regional, and local importance. 
ICICLE will provide an operational rationale and framework for a cyber infrastructure that delivers wide and easy access to smart computing, plus a conversational interface that allows stakeholders from diverse domains to ask questions and receive answers informed by currently available data and knowledge. For example, food distributors, emergency food agency managers, and logistics company executives might ask, which food supply chains will likely be affected by an approaching storm? The ICICL conversation agent might respond with, I will predict future states of your regional supply chain under forecasted weather scenarios and evaluate alternative scenarios, okay? Upon confirmation, ICICL would then retrieve satellite data on weather, connect to weather forecast models, acquire inventory data for food producers, processors, distributors, transportation networks, wholesalers, and retailers throughout the region, use AI models to forecast supply chain conditions from a baseline, and alternative logistics that maintain consistent food supply for vulnerable populations and estimate supply chain disruptions based on historical and current data from other locations, mindful of privacy. ICICL will go even further by accessing high-performance computing centers to backcast and learn how reconfigured landscape-scale precision agricultural production and distribution systems could integrate with alternative supply chain infrastructure to avoid similar future disruptions. Using an orchestra of smart cyber infrastructure elements, ICICL produces a symphonic answer that improves outcomes for diverse stakeholders. ICICL holds the potential to transform today's AI landscape from a series of fragmented tools for use by a few to one where democratized AI and integrated plug and play architecture empower diverse end users with knowledge and data flows that are science-based traceable, transparent, reusable, and trustworthy. Introducing AI for CI for AI. AI for everyone. I hope that gives you a very broad perspective of what we are trying to do. So, so this is a kind of a national infrastructure. So that has, of course, we have to solve a lot of like a foundational AI and CI problems. I'll go into a little bit more details. And we want to have these solutions, as I said, like to have an integrated plug and play. And we also want to democratize this. And of course, we want to have all these solutions being transparent, trustworthy, and trying to solve societal problems. And as we solve this, we also have a very big focus on developing the next generation workforce. The students and staffs, they should be knowing how to design solutions <coughs> towards these, these objectives, okay? So, so this is the kind of the broad, the icicle sits here. I talked about this computing continuum. These are our three uh, use inspired science cases. And within this, we have a lot of components, like I'll go into a little bit more detail, CI for AI. And this is very interesting, AI for CI. Many people know CI for AI, but I'll introduce something AI for CI. And then, of course, we have foundational AI, and then we put it all together into an icicle. And, uh, and as I said, like uh, these are the multiple pillars, uh, CI for plug and play AI, the intelligent CI, and we want to have the solution fields AS to the HPC and the cloud. And of course, we have a lot of focus on workforce development, broadening participation, inclusivity, and also the collaboration and education and outreach. So this is a very large team. Um, I'm the overall director, but we have like 14 different organizations, uh, 33 faculty, there are 58 PhDs, masters, undergrads, so it's almost like a 150 members team are, are working here. And, and these 14 organizations, we are like a coast to coast from the US, uh, like a starting from RPI, Delaware, OSU is the lead, Ohio Supercomputer Center, Case Western, Indiana, Wisconsin Madison, Iowa State, Texas Advanced Computing Center, Utah, uh, San Diego and San Diego Supercomputer Center, and then the, there is an um, NGO, IC Food, and then the UC Davis. And we have a lot of these collaborators, national labs, industry, um, and even um, some uh, uh, hospitals and all. And now actually we have expanded, even it has gone international. We have uh, supplementary funding uh, to actually take this digital agriculture to India. There was a joint US and India collaboration, so we got funding. If you see the agriculture, Challenges are same everywhere you go in the world, but the solutions could be different. Like in US, we are focusing on, let's say, soybean or wheat, but in India, it has to be potato and um, onions. 
Uh, you may say that, yeah, my solution will work, but exactly it doesn't work. I mean, if you have a model which, which identifies what are the diseases in Swabin, they will not work in a potato field. You, you have to adapt. So this is the kind of things what we are trying to do uh, with, um, uh, with India. We have a very strong um, external advisory board. Some of the people you must have known, at least in HPC, like Bepin, Dan Sanjuni, the Texas Advanced Computing Center directors, and, and we have like an advisory from all the different AI and all different things. So as I said, we started in uh, like a November 1st, 2021. So we are almost finishing the 24 months into the project. So we still have like a 36 months to go. So let me spend a little bit of time, the research challenges being done. So this is our overall architecture. So as we said, we want to democratize and we want to take everything through conversational AI. So either a farmer or a shopkeeper or a shop manager will be interacting with, with the system in a conversational AI manner. And in, inside that, we have the CI for AI, AI for CI, visual analytics um, uh, for explainability, uh, privacy, accountability, data integrity, ethics, and then there is the foundational systems AI, and of course we want to do this co-designing. So in our team, actually we have researchers and faculty members from food and agriculture, uh, the dairy distribution. So these are not computer scientists, we are actually working with them. Okay. Um, of course, that is a big challenge. If some of you know, like uh, when you do cross-disciplinary <laughs> work, um, just to understanding everybody's languages becomes a very big, big challenge. And we have done that. We have struggled through the first two years, but now things are moving. So let's see the founder systems AI, and I'll go into a little bit more details. So these are kind of like a, this is the one thrust. So these are the sub thrust. So first one is knowledge graphs. In all these examples. Now the question is, how do you abstract these things? I have so many knowledges, okay? So for example, smart food distribution, there are all distributors, there are consumers, the shops, their geographic locations, their characteristics. How do you convert them into knowledge graphs and which are very huge, and then only we can run AI models on top of that, okay? So that is kind of one thing. Model commons. So many models are being developed these days, AI models. How we can put them in a, in a common environment? So depending on the need, it will be automatically able to select that. Okay, so that is kind of a model common. Same thing happens to data commons. Adaptive AI. So this is very important. Like some of the examples, as I said, like let's say the drone is flying, and might be the wireless bandwidth is not sufficient. So the solution, what you might have designed, that AI yeah, need to send all the data to the cloud will not work. So you have to change your algorithms. It has to be adaptive depending on the bandwidth. Should I use compression or should I determine that, okay, at a certain rate, I don't have to store the data, I need to drop them, okay? And perform local computation instead of sending it to the cloud. So dynamically, you need to take these kind of decisions because some of these like flying drones are very expensive. So you get only 40 minutes or 45 minutes for some amount of money, and you need to make sure that you are utilizing them in the best possible manner. So like this, like a federated learning, because we are using a lot of these data, and if some of you people are familiar with this field, uh, people don't want to share your data, okay, in a direct manner. So this is where the federated learning comes in. So that through standardized API, can we actually take your data and still operate on it, but I don't have to see your data, okay? So that's how the field is going. And then finally, of course, conversational AI. Then CI for AI, I think many of you will relate to that. I think we do, for example, high performance training. We saw some examples like all these large models, how fast we can do using CPUs, GPUs, and all. Data management also is a big issue because all these data are coming. Where do I store the data, metadata? And then age intelligence, because we are talking about all these wireless coming to the, to the computing continuum. So we need all these age intelligence, adaptive wireless, and of course, finally, is the control and coordination. Now this is something new and I'll actually show you. So this is where I think CI for AI is, is people understand, but how about AI for CI? So if you think of like we are designing these systems, let's take a very common example of scheduling. How, how many of you have done some scheduling work? Job scheduling, we see many of you. These are all algorithms based, okay? So over the last 40 years, so many algorithms have been designed and we also use that. Currently, if you see the SLURM or any of the PBS <coughs> scheduler, there is an algorithm which is running behind. And it takes some time. Now the thing is, through this scheduling, you have so much data you have generated. Like what scheduling works, what is, there, there is no optimal scheduling, you know, like a, a practical algorithms are there. If I take all those data and build an AI model, okay? So then the next time what I can do is, I don't have to run the algorithm. I can just pass it through the, 
through the um, AI model. It'll, it'll work like an inference. Okay? So, so like this, you can see the systems. You are doing a lot of performance monitoring on the very large scale systems, so measurement. All those things, we generate so much data, now we can use that data for AI uses. Okay? Even very simple, like uh, how many of you have known like an MPI algorithms, let's say collective algorithms, how many of you know? A lot of people do optimization of collectives, all right? For all these new machines, you need to spend so many hours. Can I have all those data. Can I build an AI model? So tomorrow, there is a new machine. I don't have to spend like a 15 days to optimize my collectives. That AI model will tell me, OK? So this is the new field which is coming, AI for CI. And we have some of these solutions which are coming out. Uh, so it is a flip of CI for AI, so you can think, OK? We are using AI to develop the next generation CI, OK? So then, of course, in all these solutions, we need the, um, we have this thrust called privacy, accountability, data integrity, uh, because we want to provide transparent and trust to the solutions. And in that context, also, ethics also comes into picture, because these systems we want to design and make sure that they're also, we are being responsible. We are being ethical solutions. We are trying to provide uh, the inclusivity, bias, and all those things we, we take into account. And then for the explainability point of view, we also have a very strong visualization team who are converting these solutions through visual analytics. You can actually understand what is going on. Okay? Uh, and I'll show some details later on um, here. And then finally, thing is the co-designing. Okay? Because we are trying to not just design this purely from a computer science perspective, but we are actually working with with our researchers in the agriculture, in the smart food distribution, and then the animal ecology to make sure that the solutions actually can be deployed and then people can take advantage of it. And the broad goal is to actually put it together. So we have been funded through National Science Foundation. There is an Office of Advanced Cyber Infrastructure. So the idea is that not only we carry research, but we also have to have the softwares at deliverables, okay? So that people can start using, okay? And I'll show you, we have been releasing a lot of softwares, um, interested, People have been taking our softwares and building their ecosystem. That's how we want to even democratize the field so that these are all open source. People can go and then start building their, their own systems and, and customize this. And then, of course, we have all these uh, the broader impact. We call it a backbone network, like a diversity uh, inclusion, broadening participation, workforce development, and also knowledge transfer. So let me just. Uh, Go you through a little bit of like an accomplishment. I'll first talk about the software releases, and then each of the field, I'll try to go through some, some demos, some examples, so that you can relate to, to what we have been uh, working on. So these are the kind of the releases. If you go, we started this, like the year one was mostly understanding, developing some solution. In the year two, every three months, we have been making a lot of releases. So if you go down here, you will see like for AI for CI, there is a uh, software architecture like animal ecology, digital agriculture, so bits and pieces we have started pushing. Okay? These are not completely integrated solution because it still takes time. But uh, we don't want to like, wait until the year five and then only give you the final solution. So we are enabling the community to, to go and then build on your own or test on your own. So we made two releases just a uh, few days back. Um, we, we made also the, the third release. So let me go into a little bit of more concrete solutions, like a digital agriculture. So what does the CI for digital agriculture look like? Any, is there anybody who works in these areas? Agriculture, something? May not be, OK. Um, how to build the CI that connects a wide range of digital agriculture stakeholders, and then why use inspired CI will be transformative. So, so as you can see, there is a large sub-team um, across multiple universities and all are working together uh, to, to to bring this solution, as you can see, like hey, people are there for AI for cyber infrastructure, cyber infrastructure for AI driven privacy, accountability. So we have all this complementary expertise. So we have these four project teams. So, so we are working together to bring the solutions. So let's first do is the crop management. I motivated this example, like hey, you have a big field. And how do you, like this is my colleague, uh, Chris Stewart. We have a complete like a drone based solution. So you can actually fly the drone and then it will actually sense uh, environmental conditions, uh, we are also expanding into sensor driven. A lot of these fields, just like you know garden and all, they have like the, uh, the water um, uh, like uh, distribution, you can actually uh, find out what is the moisture or this part of the field will it need more water or that part of the field is becoming dry. You can actually get this real time information and can inform the tractors and all. And uh, so, the, so this is kind of the thing what I was telling. 
you can actually run these drones. And this is an example. We have actually working together with a, a farm in Ohio. Um, they are working with us. You can actually fly these drones. And then the thing is, what is happening through these drones, you can actually develop these models. I'll go into the next. You can actually generate this kind of a heat map. Okay? So it will tell you, look, diseases have happened in this part of the area, or this part of the area, this part of the area. And then what happens, like sometimes, you know, like hey, these, um, these unmanned aerial vehicles or drones have limited energy. Okay? So that is a big thing. It doesn't have a big amount of, it cannot run for five hours. Okay? It can only run for 15 minutes or 30 minutes. So what we have tried to do, using parallel computing in the drones themselves. Okay? So instead of like a one drone flying for a big, big area, it may take like two hours to do. If I take 10 of such drones, I can cut down. So they are actually talking to, to next other. So, so we are extending our parallel computing principles to, to really the drones talking to each other and dividing the field and exchanging information and then coming up with that kind of a, um, the map. So, so then the question is like this, all this learning, um, so let's say the diseases, how do you quickly detect? How do you develop these AI models? And any place, if you see even in the medicine and all, you need a lot of annotated data. Okay, that means in the beginning, experts have seen this, and they say, oh, this is disease one, or this is two. If you take like this, there are millions of these data you need to take, and that is very expensive. So then the question we are exploring is, can I, can I do semi-supervised learning? Okay, instead of completely supervised, which is very expensive, can I have semi-supervised? So that means I take only some samples, okay? But I can come up with a model which is mostly accurate. I can't guarantee like 100%, but I can say like a 95% accurate, okay? So this is what we have developed. So there is a small demo here. Pipeline for digital agriculture classification use cases. It addresses the bottleneck of expert labeling, biomedical research, and research and development techniques. The software is currently running on top of an HPC system, and we're accessing it using the open on-demand portal. The first step is to define our use case. We just need to enter a pointer to our data set and a list of classes to be used for labeling. For this example, we're going to use the lead detection data set. Now we hit submit, and an unsupervised learning job will be scheduled on the HPC system to cluster the data. Once the data is clustered, it's presented to us, and we only need to label a few samples for each class. The total images we need to label here represent less than 1% of the overall data set. But we labeled two classes so far. Now we need to label the soybean class. Okay. So, so like this, you can see, so in practice, this is actually running as a service. You can actually subscribe to this service, and you put your own data, and, and you should be able to generate your own model in a semi-supervised manner. Plus, the so, enabled computing continuum, we have developed a cloud-to-edge middleware for digital agriculture-related services. We call it Digital Agriculture Hub. All stakeholders can integrate their various projects as microservices using widely used programming languages like Python, running on top of Apache Web Server, and the NSF Jetstream 2 infrastructure. We can access the Digital Agriculture Hub from either of the two links below. Let's go through the Icicle software releases page. So I'll skip a little bit like some of these demos, but I'll, the slides will be available so you can actually take a look, but I'll be happy to talk. So the next is the food distribution. So the food distribution, the question is there's so much data, how do you create those knowledge graphs? Okay? And then if I can create the knowledge graphs, I should be able to operate on those faster. So this is a, like the smart food set trim. So there's just two short videos here, so let's see. Use case one, partner finder in the smart food chat. Our user, Alice, wants to find possible partners in the food system. She first drags a data loader to load prepod link, ML file, and vocabulary file. Then she connects it with an ontology filter to create the ontology of prepod. Later, in order to find target partners, she first adds the filters of use case and position type. Then she lassos the entities of interest. Our ontology filter will automatically generate the query based on these operations. She later drags a query editor to check the generated Sparkle query. 
Also, she connects a KG query to fetch data from the PPOD knowledge graph. The output can be displayed through a table viewer. From there, Alice finds possible partners to collaborate with. <coughs> So these kind of things, we are trying to make it very intuitive. Anybody can just operate on it. So, so giving like a visual interface. So this is another example like a grocery store closer. Many times you know, like a, all of a sudden a company decides that I'll close this store. What impact it has on community? What impact it has on the community health? So, so here again, we have a, like a grocery store closer team. Uh, so let's listen to this short video. The grocery store model integrates two pieces of AI technology, conversational AI, agent-based modeling to provide policymakers and other users with the ability to ask what is the scenario about food supply within the city. This demo highlights both the component technologies as well as our recent work to integrate this into the physical system. For the grocery store model conversational system, we usually focus on implementing a few shots menu parser which leverages constraint language models. Here, we can take a natural water and generate an intermediate canonical water, which can then be converted into a model for this task, we have generated a schema for the commands that the model can implement, including commands like add a grocery store, remove a convenience store, increase food availability in markets, or convert this house into a car owning house. The user enters a command like, what will be the impact on food availability if a new grocery store opens up Moon Road and dies an hour road? We include human in loop interpretation that displays candy commands sorted by a confidence score. In this version of the system, the user chooses the best interpretation, in this case number two, and then the system forwards the canonical form and command dictionary to the agent based model. The agent back end, which originally was controlled by a GUI, now interprets the command dictionary to change the model conditions. For this query, you can see that a supermarket has been added to the corner of Eisenhower Road and Moon Road. The model recalculates which households draw food from the new market, taking into account yeah, so this helps like a, anybody again, like a, just a community um, manager or anybody without even knowing what is happening can just ask. So we are trying to really bring all these solution, whatever we do in a very simple APIs so that anybody can start using this. So I talked about AI for CI, I gave this scheduling example. So this is actually a runtime predictor. So many times, you know, you submit these jobs so on this cluster, that cluster, it has 800 GPUs, that has 800 GPUs. If you can estimate its, its execution time, it will help you to build the end-to-end -end framework. So for example, that drone is flying, and in the back end, if I know I have Azure Cloud, I have my local HP center, and I know the runtime predictor, and based on the, the workload on all these cluster, I can quickly say, okay, send the job to this this, this node, you don't have to spend time on hours and trying to find out where you should be uh, submitting the jobs. So then all these things, we have, of course, this broader impact. Uh, we have been working a lot on this BPC, workforce development, knowledge transfer. So all these things, if you just go here, we have a YouTube channel. We have been actually putting a lot of materials there. So how to get engaged here? So we have a very um, lot of avenues. Um, of course, the first one is we are releasing all the software. Um, um, if you remember, like a, in my own work, like this MRP MPI library, that is, we have been doing for 22 years, um, and that is being used all over the world. The same things we are trying to achieve here, okay? Kind of a software releases so that people will take. And then we have a lot of options here: students, uh, visiting research fellow, academic collaborator, industry partners. So if you, any one of you are interested in working with us, uh, please uh, let us know, uh, and then subscribe to our mailing list. I also want to indicate this. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this, US and UK have just started an international collaboration. Um, there is a pointer here if you go, so they have an open call here. Um, one just have to write a joint expression LOI kind of things, and if things match, um, um, it can get funded from both sides. Like the US researchers will get funded from NSF, UK researchers will get funded from uh, this EPSRC. Um, so I'll be happy to talk with any one of you. I'm here today and tomorrow. Uh, if any of these things interest you, uh, we can actually talk about this. So with this, let me close here just to see the very ambitious project as you saw. We are trying to really take a very high level vision and then trying to implement and have the intelligent cyber infrastructure uh, with the through a conversational layer interface. And our goal is that even though we have started working on only these three, 
But once we have the solutions, they can be actually be extended to, to health and medicine, environment, communication, collaboration, machine learning, a lot of these applications. So that is our broad goal again. Um, we'll demonstrate for three use science cases, but we can expand as, as we go back through the collaboration. So, so through this, actually, the ICICLE, um, the goal is to really establish global leadership in computing and AI. And, and we want to make sure that we design and integrate into the national CI ecosystem. We leverage the existing recognized capabilities, collaborative, and also we want to be sustainable and um, inclusive. So with this, um, I'd like to conclude. So you see, the, these are all the team members <laughs> working here. So I'd like to give credits to all of them, OK? Uh, almost like 150 people are working, uh, working on this. So, so thank you. <laughs>